because from the very beginning of Islamic history, it's bound up with society, culture, and community formation, so much of my teaching of Islamic history ends up being sort of one battle after the other, or, or one empire rising while another falls, or the political issues of state and culture. And sometimes in the midst of that, we can get lost in some other aspects. And so I want to step out of the classroom just a little bit and have total freedom just to talk about uh, some uh, brilliant moments of Muslim architecture. This uh, few minutes will hardly be representational and not from an expert point of view. I don't really know anything about architecture. These are really kind of the places I want to go. And I've af actually left off a number of the, the great uh, mosques and Islamic buildings that I have uh, seen <clears throat> in West Asia or in Europe. And so uh, it's really just to kind of give a flavor and to kind of show some of the kind of cool aspects of Islamic architecture that we uh, see within that uh, very rich world. Okay, so nothing representational, just for the fun of it, uh, just for the beauty of it, um, but also because I think that some of these pieces actually show uh, illustrate the power of that societal formation in Islamic history and and show kind of the movement between you know um, East Asia you know Ch Chinese empires or Mongolian empires uh, in Western Europe uh, and the, those empire buildings and the architectural movements between them uh, and how much of this came out of that great Islamic golden age that peaked before Europe uh, had its own Renaissance, Enlightenment and Reformations. And so this will, I believe, give kind of some more culture and certainly some more color to uh, more traditional approaches to teaching Islamic history. Okay. Now, Okay, let's first, uh, Timurlane, of course, uh, the, the, you know, Timur the Lame, uh, a, a brilliant kind of architectural feat uh, takes place under Tamerlane's leadership uh, in uh, Samarkand, Uzbekistan, and, and really a distinctive Muslim architectural style. The domes have been part of Islamic architecture from the beginning, l representing that cosmic reality, maybe growing organically, even before kind of an intellectual idea came out of it uh, and uh, you know here in Uzbekistan you get an example of this this is actually a shrine although uh, the 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 buildings around it you end up getting various teaching centers mosques community centers and the like as part of that this this uh, teal blue color is such a, a sophisticated aspect of the Tamerlane architectural style here at Gur eh, Amir, um, and the, which was uh, his shrine. Um, uh, this is an inside view. None of, none of these pictures are, are my own, obviously. An inside view showing how uh, the ornate reality, uh, the tomb of Tamerlane, uh, has a uh, intense and uh, intimate design features in every inch of the mausoleum, every inch of the tomb. Uh, it's a, it's a, it's a, um, a strange and beautiful uh, co complex of artistic uh, materials. And we see here uh, another piece is actually just on the outside uh, against one wall uh, that we've got uh, some of this example of you've got the teal with the other kinds of blues that are mixed in to uh, quite a small tile work. Sometimes this ends up getting taken up with literature, uh, Arabic literature, other times images, uh, mythic images or artistic images. Here we have some uh, symbolic things flowers and other kinds of designs but certainly a key part of this right. okay <clears throat> all right so uh moving uh from a tomb uh to i guess a, a castle we might call it uh, uh and moving uh, quite across the muslim world from uzbekistan to andalusia to spain we have the Alhambra here. The Alhambra being, of course, a famous piece uh, that sits in the back of much of European history. And as you can see, certainly a huge complex uh, that exists uh, here. Oops, um, a little bit out of, uh, um, uh, you know, moving quickly kind of through this. We have this, this gorgeous piece here inside the Alhambra. Uh, again, that architectural detail moving from the outside to the inside. And this is just one room of many within that complex 
uh, uh, that is the Alhambra in Spain. Here's another image uh, of uh, the uh, from the inside looking up. Just this incredible uh, view uh, here, leaning less upon the blues, but certainly not any less ornate and and filled with gold imagery. I mean, th these are buildings that took often a generation to build. And of course, uh, moving now south to India, uh, the Taj Mahal, uh, the great mogul, uh, you know, the great mogul piece of art that probably, uh, could, I mean, literally, it means that the, the Taj Mahal means the crown of the palace, right? The Taj Mahal being, uh, I think, probably one of the best examples of, of Indian Muslim architecture. India today um, is one of the largest Muslim countries in the world, uh, number two or number three in terms of Muslim population. And for the last 700 years, has either not been re led by uh, Hindu uh, leaders, except, except since um, the late 1940s, but has been led by either Muslim empires, uh, Muslim leadership, uh, groups, caliphates, or um, by uh, Britain. <clears throat> and so we have here, uh, this uh, was a commission in 1632, though it took a whole generation to complete, finishing in the 1658, commissioned by the Mughal Emperor Shah Jahan. Uh, this was going to be the house of the tomb of his favorite wife, uh, Muntaz Mahal. Now, uh, you should know that there's actually scho some scholars think that actually just built it for himself but anyway it's, it's kind of romantic i suppose to say hey dear i'm gonna you know build you this remarkable tomb it's going to take the resources of an entire generation and employ thousands of people and become uh the jewel of the crown of islamic architecture in the world <clears throat> okay so uh it's a it's a 42 acre complex a huge complex includes mosque guest houses gardens uh as you can see here and really is kind of a picture of paradise kind of in architectural form of an islamic view of uh, paradise okay um yeah so uh this is a, a gorgeous piece i would love to go and see the taj mahal as many millions of people do each day this is actually the main uh, uh gateway uh, Darwaza to the Taj Mahal. So um, I don't know what your front door looks like, but this I think is a pretty impressive, uh, impressive piece of architecture. Uh, this is a Western building. Uh, it's a mosque, and it faces the tomb. So it's on the opposite side of that large plaza between the two buildings. And I and this is a kind of a terrible picture, but here I just grab some pictures of various kinds of design elements within and outside of the Taj Mahal. You can see. You know the friezes, uh, the the complex uh, design on you know that make up mosaics, literature, floral designs, uh, as well as different um, kinds of ceramics. Okay, now now and it's it's just a, an intriguing place. I, I can't wait to go. Now moving uh, north and a bit west to uh, to uh, Iran. This is just a quick picture to capture this gorgeous imagery of Nasir al muk Mosque in Shiraz. Uh, I, I think this is just incredible. I, I don't know how one could just uh, concentrate in prayer in this sort of place without just looking all the time and seeing the glorious light that comes in. Uh, certainly stained glass becomes a European feature. The, the sheer color and infusion of this piece I think is unique. And we also have, um, uh, moving uh, west again to Turkey, to Edirn, uh, in Turkey, uh, this is the uh, Selimiye Mosque, okay, built, um, it built, I believe, in the period of Suleiman the Magnificent, uh, a really important uh, part and written, or written and designed by uh, this uh, particular um, architect here, uh, um, <clears throat> Sinan, uh, who actually, uh, this would really, I think, be a a influence upon like the Taj Mahal and some other architectural styles really kind of one of the best that you can get uh, in uh, Turkey uh, and uh, really defines the Ottoman Empire the, their their sense of grandness their sense of of, of um, symmetry the the color uh, and where there is austerity as you can see this this um, um, palace uh, it looks like but it's a mosque has uh, both austerity and audacious design elements in it and you can kind of see that here where there's a kind of plainness or white space that's used to contrast the ornate qualities that we get uh, and you don't always get that and as we've seen in the other pictures where every inch is filled with with color and design elements uh, that's not always the case here um, in uh, in this what becomes the defined Ottoman style 
Okay. Um, Damascus in Syria, one of the great uh, the great cities of the ancient world, Damascus, and uh, unfortunately beleaguered in the last oh, the, the last few years uh, since the rise of the Islamic State in in, uh, in Iraq and Levant, ISIL or ISIS. Uh, but uh, Damascus, one of the earliest uh, places uh, for development of Islam. This is a picture at nighttime of the Umayyad Mosque. Uh, and here's a picture uh, from a different angle uh, of the daytime. Um, and uh, this treasury here that you can see in the picture that's foregrounded also has design elements that connected back to Mecca so that there's a way of knowing what way to face, uh, what way to begin Hajj, what way to face in prayer. Uh, and so really kind of an important uh, feature of uh, of mosques that exist throughout the world. You can see again the ornate stuff, but then there's an ancientness to the brick. This is an early mosque. It's not built primarily out of wealth, but primarily primarily out of devotion uh, in this particular period. Here's a picture on the inside uh, where you can see that uh, there's some people reading here, but this is be people would gather for prayer. Uh, mosques, of course, also work as uh, community centers uh, and uh, really become the center of the Islamic community in whatever place that they develop. You can also see, I mean, Corinthian columns, right? So, uh, you know, the Islamic world grows up, you know, right next, I mean, smack between the Byzantine Empire, uh, the, the you know, and um, in the west of the Islamic world, and the Sassanid or Sassanian Empire, the Persians in the east of that world grows up in the midst of that, and so really there are influences that you can find from the Mediterranean and the Greco-Roman world. Now, moving quite some distance now to Africa to Mali. Uh, to Jenne, this is the Great Mud Mosque, and I don't really have anything else to say about that except look at this. This is the Great Mud Mosque. It's a, a mosque. It's a giant sandcastle mosque, uh, and each year at a certain point uh, after the rains come, the villagers in Jenne get together and uh, they create a mud and they basically cake their mosque uh, and and give it another year of growth. Now they're you know it's in constant um, decay. Uh, from the elements when there's an off-season rain or storm it, uh, you can lose parts of the mosque that have to be rebuilt uh, the, the, it cakes and, and cracks in the sun and it has to be kind of recovered each year and the mosque you know as a as a result evolves at a much quicker rate than really you know those great palaces of stone and marble and gold that we have seen uh, in some of the other pictures you know, so pretty pretty remarkable uh, piece here. And so you can actually look through history at the paintings and pictures of this mosque, and it's changed quite a lot over time. And there's some kind of intuitive design elements too. Like so, there's an ostrich egg at the top of each of these um, pinnacles. I believe it's an ostrich egg. It may be artificial at this point, but you know you could say that's a visual design element. But at one point that may also have been directional. But in any case, what it has done, architecturally speaking, is actually keep rain and the elements off of the, the one um, most tender spot in, in a pinnacle of this type. Where, uh, and so it actually moves the water and the, the movement of the heavy rains that come in torrents around that particular piece and then down the edges of, um, of the tower. So it's pretty cool. Pretty cool mosque. Jenny Mali, I can't wait to go see that. <coughs> All right. Now this is the uh, Sheikh Zayed uh, Grand Mosque um, in the United Arab Al uh, Emirates. Excuse me. And uh, this is, uh, I think, I think about as contrasting of this as you can possibly get. I, I just can't imagine a greater contrast. I mean, just the richness of this. But notice it's not ornately filled, every detail is filled, but they allow the whiteness of the stone, the marble, and the simplicity of design to speak while still communicating in a fusion. Now, if you don't think of this as a rich place, if you can't think of this as a rich place, uh, Abu Dhabi, uh, here's an example of the inside. <laughs> That's something. Can you imagine uh, just uh, this uh, glorious? I mean, it looks like a palace, um, um, but it's a, it's a grand mosque that, that has been sponsored uh, and then built um, with a whole different kind of architecture. 
Uh, now, uh, it's not just mosques in the uh, or palaces in the Islamic world uh, and community centers, but you also get things like bathhouses. I don't don't really know a lot about bathhouses. I've never been to like a Turkish bath or something like that. Uh, uh, that that's that uh, wasn't just a ruins. Uh, I've been to some ruins, but here's the Sultan Amir uh, Ahmed uh, bathhouse in Kashan in Iran, um, and just to g kind of give you a sense of the beautiful design. I mean, talk about bathing in beauty. I, I hop in and out of the shower and I'm pleased to have hot water in my world. But look at the the beauty and the construction of this particular piece, and you can also see elements of new and old as technologies develop. Here's another picture uh, from within the same bathhouse, but from a different uh, particular bath. Uh, this uh, uh, gold uh, just <laughs> filling the room, but then uh, the water and the pool being the center of it. Okay. Uh, going to Alexandria. Uh, in Egypt, a, a different kind of picture. Uh, Egypt uh, is uh, known uh, for its ancient history. Uh, it was uh, conquered by early uh, Islamic um, um, generals uh, during the period of the Rashidun Caliphate, the early companions of the Prophet, in which, and then finally a peace agreement was struck and Muslims ruled uh, through the centuries after that point various kinds of empires but early on there's development in alexandria that great city of first the jews then that great city of the christians then becomes a muslim uh, city in the seventh and eighth century this is the abu al abbas al uh, mosque in in alexandria and just a quick picture of the inside you can see the carefully designed uh, mat spaces for muslims to be able to pray during one of their five daily prayer times so if they come to the mosque to pray uh, but also this uh, huge uh, there's a, still a sense of ornateness and a grandeur there on the outside what a striking difference in color though the design elements kind of move one to the other and there'll be times where there'll be outside prayers as well uh, some have called Cairo the city of a thousand minarets. Cairo is an invented city, not one of the ancient cities, only about uh, 1,100 years old or thereabouts, particularly uh, uh, settled uh, uh, and grown up during the Fatimids, uh, who made, uh, named after Fatima, the uh, daughter of the prophet Muhammad, made Cairo the capital, and then the minaret becomes a symbol of this particular uh, development as we'll see in the next slide i believe the next picture this one i think is such an interesting angle because you have the industrial city the city with all its communication technologies buildings and all of that between a muslim minaret on one side and then the ancient tombs you know of the kings of egypt the the pyramids that exist uh, out there um in, in the desert so a really interesting uh, contrast, really interesting contrast. Okay, here's uh, a city of Cairo, uh, and it's all all its more modern brilliance, but uh, Sultan Hassan Mosque in the foreground. See the number of minarets that exist there, and this kind of, as well as the gardens, and so you see this kind of ancient reality that sits in such an interesting contrast to Cairo, which is a modern, uh, growing, developing city. There's a new economic and and government uh, center that's been built outside the city on the other side of the city and such a, a, a international place of of uh, you know what is meant to be a 21st century city but still we have this 8th 9th 10th century kind of world within it uh, this particular mosque is not terribly old uh, 1359 uh, but uh, really kind of important to the world uh, of, of Cairo uh, here's a picture on the inside of, of this and you can see such a contrast too, right the outside and then the inside uh, and this world of uh, you know it reminds you that there's a world of prayer a world of devotion that's part of that reality now this is al rifai uh, in cairo uh, this is just actually a few steps next to the sultan ha hassan um, a mosque that I just mentioned uh, before and a really interesting contrast this one in a sense looks older but it's actually uh, uh, much newer this is a 19th century uh, a building that took a whole generation this came after uh, reforms by Muhammad Ali through Egypt to reform culture uh, reform religion uh, and this is one of the pieces that was built on to support that particular reform in Cairo 
Okay. Um, the Al Rafai Mosque also hosts uh, the name of the uh, the you know Al Rafai uh, the the Sheikh uh, Al Rafai, uh, and uh, in the name of uh, it, this me medieval Islamic saint, I guess would be the right word, uh, a key figure. There's also a mausoleum for the Shah of Iran, and and so on. So. Uh, this is the mausoleum picture here, and you can see there's obviously a tourist uh, attraction that there now. And I'm actually really kind of struck by the echo of these walls, quite distinctive from the ancient Egyptians, and yet there's something that kind of evokes it for me, the way that the stone and the colors and the images work. Not quite telling the pictures, um, but uh, different than um, sort of the richness that we get in typical kind of Islamic design that we would see there. Now this is Al Hasar, uh, sorry, Al Azhar, uh, also in Cairo, um, uh, the, like well over a thousand years old, established in 970. Uh, one of the original uh, places that we see that's uh, designed um, within that early Egyptian empire, uh, and uh, and the way that it wants to distinguish itself from the Muslim world, but also from Coptic Christians who are still a large percentage of the population. Uh, 1100 years ago or 1050 years ago uh, here's a, d a different view uh, um, a different part of Ca Cairo and uh, of course Al-Azhar is a uh, uh, university it may maybe one way of putting it might be the oldest university in the world although there's really some debate over how that would work right um, this uh, is a mosque uh, Ibn Tal Tulun's mosque and, and probably the oldest surviving mosque in Cairo from 884 so I suppose before it was officially the capital of the Fatimid Caliphate but in any case uh, this particular um, mosque in its simplicity made from you know sandstone uh, used for usefulness has survived in the you know, 11, you know, 1136 years uh, from that point to the point of this video. Okay, here's a different uh, image of it, uh, one that um, uh, shows uh, its particular structure, uh, but it's not without design. Right? You can see the ornate nature uh, of uh, this particular work in stone here. Um, and uh, there are some uh, uh, ancient aspects of it that are held, uh, uh, you know, completely or as much as possible uh, in the original state, as you can see here, not fully restored, but left to look in its ancient glory. Well, from beginning and from luxury uh, to, uh, you know, the work of the hand, from ornate design to allowing the stones and the space to speak, from usefulness uh, to grandeur, uh, we can see that Islamic architecture has been such a powerful feature of their artistic development. When you have a religion that is pulling itself away from images of, of people in the divine, it's going to speak in other ways, and one of the ways it speaks is through the artistic, scientific, architectural, uh, the architectonic, the, the design elements, uh, the use of color and space, the you know the sense of bringing earth and heaven together into conversation, of connecting the local people throughout the world back to Mecca. All of these elements are part of Islamic design and really create a, what I think is a gorgeous historical reality uh, as we understand it in the world today. And I hope, I hope. I hope to get to visit each of these places sooner than later.